Dear friends, let us start, otherwise we'll have people coming in all, uh, all the time. I'm happy to see so many people here. I guess we are having the second star tonight after Rem Kulhas, uh, because I can see as many people as there would be for Michael Jackson's concert. So we are having uh, Philip Hook's presentation of his book, which is called at Sotheby, um, Breakfast at so Sotheby, and you can probably feel this associ association with uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and uh, um, um, Philip has been working for uh, Sotheby's as a senior uh, director, and he has uh, been working in the art world for uh, um, over 35 years, and uh, uh, it's uh, very important for us to have this support uh, from a commercial organization because we are um, a non-commercial organization. So thank you for coming and uh, I'm sure that Philip Hook will um, talk uh, about many interesting things tonight and I'm sure that you might want to buy this book. Uh, I'm sure you will want to buy this book after this lecture and uh, Philip uh, um, will be happy to sign this book for you. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the price is not very high and um, even um, I have been very busy recently. I still had time um, to uh, read it. And I would like to give the floor to uh, Mikhail, who, work, who is working for Sotheby's. Good evening. Uh, actually, what I wanted to say has already been said by Anton. I don't know why Anton had to mention this. So I'm not going to say it again, and I'd love just to say one thing. When I met some charming women that um, were working with the Sotheby's at the, in the late 80s in the Soviet Union, they started thinking about those uh, glorious times when the Politburo and Communist Party let uh, um, hold the first auction. So, and it was uh, Sotheby auction for the first time in the history of uh, our country. So it was the first time when they met some man from our company. And Philip Hook was not among those men because he was working for a different company. I'm not going to mention it here to you. Uh, and a few years later, Philip Hook um, became... Uh, uh, began to work for Sotheby's and those ladies got to know him before the Soviet Union collapsed and turned into the Russian Federation. So before that, my colleagues hoped that there would be the second auction held here. But unfortunately, it never held again. But anyway, they met uh, Philip Hook. And when in 2007, we opened a daughter company here, and Philip, who came to visit us, I uh, was happy to invite all those uh, veterans. And uh, I mentioned that we are going to have the president of our company, we are going to have a lord. Uh, and, um, I, and when I mentioned that also Philip Hook was going to be here, they, they were so extremely happy. And that's how they came for the first uh, um, uh, exhibition that was opening in Moscow. So um, actually for me, it was the first time when I met Philip Hook in 2007. And um, um, I, I was based here in Moscow. And this was the first time for me to get to know most of the company. So. Uh, it was um, great for me to get to know um, Englishmen, and I guess I know them much better than an average uh, Moscow resident uh, uh, knows. And um, actually, there were uh, very few gentlemen that uh, basically um, um, uh, embodied this ideal image of a perfect Englishman uh, that uh, uh, we can find in some literary works in uh, uh, great literature of the past. So it's an excellent uh, gentleman. Um, he is like uh, James Bond for me. He's got these aristocratic manners. Uh, um, and he has uh, uh, such a charismatic, uh, such a charming person, uh, like a nectar. And uh, I'm sure that you will see it yourself. And I'm sure that you will be able to see even more than that. He wrote many books. And... Um, 
if um, uh, the uh, literary, uh, if books uh, um, uh, uh, made more money, he would probably focus on uh, uh, literature and uh, uh, writing. But uh, since uh, it hasn't uh, yet uh, happened uh, uh, like that, uh, so that's why he uh, is working with us at the new Bond Street. And uh, we are very happy to have him as part of our team. And uh, when I was talking to Philip and when I saw him, how he um, communicates with other people, I could, can say that his professionalism is a great achievement. And uh, the fact that he is such a charming man, that it's so easy for him to conquer women's hearts. Uh, he has these natural abilities. This is half of his success. And so the second half of his success is that he can also find a way to men's hearts because he's a passionate uh, football lover and um, a passionate uh, um, football fan. And his previous visit here was related to the exhibition that uh, was opened here that showed some impressionist uh, paintings and modernist uh, paintings. But in fact, it also coincided with a great football match, and that was uh, the reason why Philip came here. But today we are not having any football matches in Moscow, and so it means that uh, uh, Philip just loves Moscow, he respects Moscow people, and I'm very happy to give him the microphone. Otherwise, I'll uh, keep on uh, uh, raving about him for ages. Thank you, Misha. Thank you, Anton. I feel my entire life has been laid bare to you. Um, but I need to thank you, the audience, in advance for listening to me in English. I'm sorry that I'm not speaking in Russian, but I hope that um, you will understand most of what I say and that you will enjoy uh, what I have to say to you. Because I thought it might amuse you to hear um, some of the material that I have written about in the book, Breakfast at Sotheby's, um, I've drawn together various strands from the book, and I've put together the 10 questions that you need to answer in order to establish the value of a painting. Now, obviously, I'm going to give away a lot of secrets tonight, so I hope you will forget them all when you leave. But here it is. How much is it worth? The 10 questions that you need to answer in order to establish the value of painting. So here's the first one. Is it authentic? Well, you would have thought that that was a pretty basic uh, necessity to know this. But the interesting thing is that there are degrees of authenticity. On at one extreme, you can have the complete fake that is just a copy uh, of a picture. And at the other extreme, you can have the totally authentic, genuine Rembrandt, say, that whose provenance you can trace back all the way to the artist's studio. And in between, there are pictures like this one. A self-portrait which, in the 19th century, was felt to be definitely by Rembrandt. But since then, uh, it has been downgraded by Rembrandt scholars, so that now, when we were asked to sell this picture about three years ago, uh, we catalogued it as simply uh, School of Rembrandt and <coughs> put an estimate on it of something around about $10,000. When it came to be sold, it actually 
fetched $240,000, which is a very mysterious price, because if it was genuine, it would be worth hundreds of times that. But if it was just a copy, it would be worth 10,000. So there is this range which reflects, I think, the speculative possibility of the attribution of the picture. Next question, is the artist fashionable? Well, this is a, this is a huge question, but I just wanted to make the general point that in my lifetime in the art world, there has been a tremendous change in what is fashionable, in, what, in where the glamour and the money is focused in the market. 30 years ago, it was on old masters. Old masters was where the market was. Um, today, it's totally focused on contemporary art. There's been this huge change, and I don't think there has ever been a time when uh, the art market has been so dominated by contemporary art as it is now. From, um, from Tracy Emin, this, um, which I'm showing you here, I'm showing you this, um, there is a long story attached to this, if there is time, I will come back to it later, but let me move forward. I leave you with that, with that tantalizing thought. Um, Jeff Koons, when this was sold for $55 million uh, a couple of years ago, it was the most expensive work uh, ever sold by a living artist, $55 million. And then this extraordinary price for the um, for the Bacon portrait of Freud, which um, achieved $143 million two years ago. The interesting thing about this is that 12 years ago, the highest price for any work by Bacon was $8 million. So it's moved from $8 million to $143 million in 10 years. So... Contemporary is king in the market now. Third question, how important is the artist in art history? Well, um, artists do, as I say, go in and out of fashion, but there are some eternal certainties. We know that Rembrandt, Titian, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Rubens, uh, Picasso, Matisse, they are eternals, but there are other artists which become more or less valuable uh, because of art historical reappraisals. And one of the interesting ways that this can happen is by big uh, retrospectives in museums on a particular artist. And uh, three or four years ago, there was a wonderful retrospective of Miro in the Tate in London. And rather conveniently, we managed at Sotheby's, um, I hope you won't find this too shocking, we managed at Sotheby's to get in for sale a really good Miro just at the time that the exhibition was at its peak, when the interest in Miro was huge. And this uh, painting sold for 25 million pounds, way above its estimate, and I'm sure that a spike in the prices was created by that uh, huge promotion to the artist and the artist's name that the exhibition in the Tate gave it just at that moment. So um, one of the arts, the devilish arts of the auctioneer is to time the sale to coincide with a big retrospective of the artist's concern. Okay, now this is a, an interesting concept. Positive romantic baggage. 
does the artist have it? There are a number of things that happen to an artist that become part of his or her myth, the romance of their personal story, that when it's reflected in their art, adds to the value of the painting concerned. Um, unhappy love affairs, so a, picture, a painting done by an artist of someone with whom he was unhappily in love adds value to the painting. Um, madness is quite good news, I'm afraid, in terms of increasing the value of a painting. Madness, yes. Illness, no. Because people, buyers, feel that if an artist was ill when he painted a picture, then just possibly he may have produced not as good a painting as he would have if he'd been healthy. But if he painted a picture when he was mad, great, because madness is very close to creativity and it's good news. Uh, dying young is not a bad idea either as a career move. It limits the number of paintings by that artist that will come on the market. It creates rarity. It's, 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 um, it's positive. But let's just look in more detail at one particular artist, the great Van Gogh, because obviously he's incredibly important art historically as the inventor, if you like, the originator of Expressionism, as one of the most important motive forces of modernism. But there is also a personal story to Van Gogh that plays into his art. It's the fact that he had no success in his own life, the fact that he was very close to madness, the fact that he wrote wonderful letters, the fact that he, in the end, committed suicide. They all add to the romance of Van Gogh. They all add, therefore, to both his emotional and his financial appeal. As an illustration of this, I have to tell you about a book that came out about three years ago, which was a new biography of Van Gogh. And in this biography, the authors suggested that Van Gogh had not actually committed suicide, but that he had been shot accidentally by a peasant out shooting rabbits that afternoon. Now, this is a terrible story for the market. It had to be suppressed immediately. Um, we don't want to know that he didn't commit suicide because committing suicide is part of that crucial myth. And I'm relieved to be able to report that this uh, theory did not gain much acceptance and prices for Van Gogh have continued to rise. Is the painting from a desirable phase in the artist's development? Well, obviously, there are some phases uh, in an artist's work which are more important, more desirable than others. Um, Picasso, just as an example, all Picassos are very, very desirable in the market. But some are really, really desirable. And anything from 1932, which is the date of this painting, uh, of Mary Therese, the great, um, one of the great loves of Picasso's life, uh, this 1932 work has got just about everything that the market wants from Picasso. It's got color, it's got sensuality, it's got um, size, it's a lovely, lovely thing. And if it came up for auction, it would probably make something in the region of a hundred million dollars plus. Now that's Picasso in 1932. Here's Picasso in 1969. Um, a bit different. I think the nicest thing you could say is that perhaps he had a hangover that morning and um, he wasn't on his greatest form anyway. 
And late Picasso's, although once or twice he was able to produce a masterpiece, late Picasso's generally aren't nearly as desirable to the market as the great works of the early 1930s. Sixth question, is it typical? Now, a typical work in this dreadful commercial world we live in is very desirable because I want you to imagine yourselves as a very rich new buyer of Impressionist paintings and if you buy a Monet for several million dollars would you rather it look like this or would you rather it look like this um, this is a portrait of his daughter. It's very well painted, but it has absolutely minimal re relative value because it's not immediately recognizable as a Monet. You want high recognizability. You want people to come into your house, see your Monet on the wall, and say, oh my God, you've got a Monet. <laughs> And they won't necessarily do it with this one. <laughs> now, has the painting got wall power? Wall power is a difficult uh, concept exactly to define to you, but it is that impact that a painting makes that really makes you want to own it. It's a combination of things like the composition, the size, um, the quality and the color. Color is incredibly important in this, um, in this respect. I have actually made a study of the prices of classic Mondrians, you know, this sort of format of the grid with different squares or rectangles colored in with different colors. And yes, it's good news financially to have a bit of blue and a bit of yellow. But what absolutely is essential to sell a Mondrian of this sort really well uh, is red. You won't see one without red in the top five prices for Mondrians of this type. Red is the color. And as an illustration of this, I'm going back to the mirror that we sold so well. That little bit of red at the bottom is incredibly important in this picture. If you put your hand up and take it away, the picture doesn't work nearly as well. It's not nearly as exciting. And that little strand of red, I would say, is worth about $21 million. <laughs> okay, subjects. Now, I'm talking here not necessarily, not about contemporary art, which operates on quite different principles, but on traditional art. Uh, that there are some subjects which are definitely far, far more commercial than others. Uh, sunny landscapes, sell much better than landscapes with bad weather. Um, boring old men don't sell as portraits nearly as well as accessible looking women, ideally horizontal. <laughs> I'll just show you these two again because they're both by the great American portraitist John Singer Sargent. But this very boring man sold for $30,000. And this horizontal woman sold for $2.5 million within 12 months of each other. Here is a very lovely uh, work by Matisse that we thought was going to do very, very well when we got it. And in fact, it was deeply disappointing for one reason. The line of her mouth, she is scowling. She should be smiling. 
I can't think what Matisse was thinking when he allowed his brush to go down rather than up, because down, she's gloomy, and the picture only made $1.2 million. Just that little change to a smile, and it would have been worth $10 million. I can't really forgive Matisse for that. Uh, that is a Matisse that actually, where she is smiling, and this actually made $21 million. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Just very quickly, a, um, something that illustrates one other element in a painting that is very bad news, and that is death. Anything dead in a painting reduces its value seriously. So this sort of classic uh, uh, still life, 19th century still life, uh, actually I put it up because I remember when I was much younger having to catalogue this picture and in my enthusiasm to make it as saleable as possible, uh, I didn't refer to the dead birds. I described it as still life with fruit and sleeping birds. <laughs> But unfortunately, no one was deceived, and no one bid on it. Uh, nudes, well, we'll come back to those too, but um, let me just very quickly say what I was going to say about these. Um, nudes are pretty good news, provided the subjects are attractive human beings. Uh, but at, at, a top, at a higher level, that is something one has to bear in mind when trying to sell uh, great paintings by major modern masters to the Middle Eastern museums, um, if they are nudes, that there is obviously a cultural resistance to nudes from these new Middle Eastern museums. Uh, but I've noticed that a Cezanne like this where the nudes are not too defined and not too in your face, if you like, is just possibly going to be bought by a Middle Eastern buyer. But one like this by Modigliani is too, 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 um, what's the word? Too erotic, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say, um, and would not be bought. Uh, by Middle Eastern Museum. However, there are plenty of other buyers in the market who are not Middle Eastern Museums. And when this one came up four years ago, it fetched $69 million. That's other bits. Uh, I said death wasn't good news, but if the artist is important enough, then those rules are transcended. Here is a really great painting by Rubens. Uh, the subject is not promising. It's a scene of mass infanticide. It's the massacre of the innocents. But it is the most powerful and glorious piece of painting and um, sold at Sotheby's actually nearly 15 years ago, uh, now for 46 million pounds. Is it in good condition? Uh, well, obviously, that is, um, that is a technical element that you will need to, um, you will need to get proper technical advice on. I'm not going to go into that too far now. Um, and finally, what's its provenance? Uh, what is the history of the painting? Because there is no doubt that the news, that the information that a Cezanne, for instance, was in a great collection. For instance, the Mellon collection in America makes it more valuable than if it uh, didn't have that provenance. Uh, one sees it also with certain Impressionist pictures, that if they have the provenance of the original <coughs> Impressionist dealer, uh, Durand Gruel, then they are that much more valuable because they have that imprimatur of quality and great provenance. 
Finally, well, there are our 10 questions. So if any of you have a painting which you can honestly say you would answer yes to every single one of those questions about, will you please let me know because we want to hear from you. <laughs> um, as it is, I don't want at all to uh, underplay how difficult it is to estimate what a painting is worth. Uh, and I come back to this painting by, it's actually a pastel, by Edvard Munch that we sold at Sotheby's in 2012 and it fetched the then world record price for a work of art of $120 million. Um, I'm quite embarrassed to look back on how little we knew about the potential of this painting. It was incredibly difficult for all, our, all of us with our combined experience to make a decision about what the right estimate for this painting, for this work was. Such a famous image, one of the most famous images in the history of art, but a pastel which traditionally is felt to be less valuable than an oil. The previous highest price for an oil by Munch was just $35 million. Uh, and really, until the hammer actually fell, as I say, on 120 million, when we were absolutely delighted, um, we really didn't know what was going to happen. But one thing I was very intrigued by, and that was that there was so much publicity about this painting in the lead up to the actual sale that in Britain, bookmakers, betting shops, uh, offered odds on what the price of the monk was going to be. So you could go into a betting shop and put money on what the price was going to be for this, this um, the screen when it came up. And Extraordinarily, the shortest odds that were quoted by the bookmakers was that on the price of $125 million. So they were just $5 million out. And that makes me realize that although I think I may be an expert after 40 years in the business, that is someone in the betting shop business who knows far more about art than I do. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. I have read your book, like I said, and uh, I found some uh, very interesting things there. I'm sorry, um, um, I'm, I have this privilege to ask questions first. Uh, um, on the 12th of June, we're going to open our permanent building of the museum, and you mentioned that museums sometimes affect uh, um, auctions and bidding and the prices of works. So what can you say? Do the museums affect uh, um, uh, art prices uh, and auctions in particular and those record bre um, bre breaking prices that you mentioned? Well, certainly um, museums do have a, a very important and big effect on the market. Uh, it's, it's an interesting and sometimes a challenging relationship between museums and um, the art market, but I, I want to look at, at, the, at the positive sides. Um, I do think that the interplay between the two can have enormously positive effects. I think that uh, the artists, particularly in the contemporary field, who um, reach uh, a level of importance do so through a sort of twin process of um, validation from both museums and the market. And it's a very interesting process to watch. 
but I just wanted to say, from my point of view, as a specialist in rather older paintings, um, how there has been there have been positive things about the relationship between uh, the market and museums that I've been involved with. Um, one of them, for instance, was illustrated by a collector, a client, a buyer that uh, I dealt with, who put together a really marvelous collection of Impressionist paintings, but then came to me and said, I don't want to have these paintings at home uh, for security reasons. And I was then able to go to the National Gallery in London and get them loaned to the National Gallery for a five-year period, which is a situation in which everyone wins, really, because the museum get the paintings for exhibition uh, pretty much free of charge except for the insurance. The, uh, the owner uh, gets the problem of the security taken off his or her hands and, most important, the public get to see the pictures. And those sort of moments when the market can help the museum uh, are very important to me. That, that has been very convincing and now I'd love to move on to more provocative questions. Since you have been working at the auction house for a long time and you related to Impressionism because uh, we are having um, great uh, collections in Russian museums, uh, um, uh, Shchuki and Morozov's collection of Impressionists, uh, both here in Moscow and in St. Petersburg and in other cities. So you probably notice this. So um, what has happened over this time and what can you predict for the nearest future? Well, um, talking particularly about impre Impressionism and the market for Impressionism, uh, one thing which I always enjoy about dealing with Russian collectors and buyers, and there are a number of new Russian collectors and buyers in the Impressionist field, is how many of them do feel a deep sense of connection to a tradition that what Morozov and Shimkin achieved in the first part of the 20th century is an incredibly important thing and something that Russia rightly is very proud of and that, um, that ability, that talent, that extraordinary genius at spotting and then buying the great contemporary art uh, is something that I think stimulates a lot of Russians to collect and it will be very interesting to see who the new Shukins and Morozovs are uh, in this generation, who the, maybe there are some connected with Garage. Uh, we shall see. <laughs> but just, on, just getting on about Impressionism for a moment, uh, of course, Impressionism changed enormously in its appeal to people over the century, century and a half almost, since it was invented. And initially, it was felt to be incredibly difficult contemporary art. It was the first instance of that being a really difficult contemporary art that people did not generally understand. And it's gone from that to being um, just about the most commercial and attractive and accessible art in the market. And one that new buyers from even from emerging economies are instantly attracted to. It's, it's, it's got such a fascinating, enduring appeal to, to um, people coming, rich people coming into the market for the first time. Те люди, которые только э, знакомятся с искусством и прикасаются к этому арт-рынку. 
So you mentioned some buys from the Middle East museums, uh, which is very abstract. I guess there's this understanding that these are the people of some ruling dynasties that buy some works of art for um, huge money. Um, uh, maybe it's art of the um, 19th or 20th century, but also we can see lots of fairs, lots of different uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong networks, uh, or in South America. So what regions? do you think are the growing, um, uh, most rapidly growing, or those that move away, away from the scene? What can we expect in the nearest future? Well, it's certainly been a feature of the art market in the past few years that more and more buyers at the top end of the market have come into operation out of the emerging economies. So, I mean, obviously, there are important Russian buyers now that weren't there 20 years ago. There are uh, important, uh, serious collectors now coming, emerging out of China, Southeast Asia. Um, Brazil, interestingly, is becoming more and more, um, one sees more and more Brazilians at the big modern sales in London and New York. Uh, Indians, certainly, and people from the Middle East. Um, I think that this is, in market terms, reassuring, because it illustrates the enormous globalization of the market. Uh, the last time we had a slump in the picture market, it was at the beginning of the 1990s when the Impressionist market fell because it had become very, very dependent on just one group of buyers, which was the Japanese. And the Japanese came out of the market in 1990. Uh, the Impressionist market fell away dramatically. But that is not going to happen now because even if one section of the buying um, <coughs> public for major in, uh, paintings, modern paintings, falls away, there are four or five still operating across the globe and it's a much more um, secure situation from that point of view. Um. I guess uh, this is going to be my last question. There is a chapter in your book where you describe 10 most recognizable uh, works of art uh, in the world, the most important for humankind. And there's not a single work of art by uh, the artist from the Soviet Union, for example. And actually, this was uh, where I got stuck, and I uh, felt really offended um, because uh, um, I thought that Black Square by Malevich deserves to be part of those ten. Uh, so I'd love to hear either your comments or apologies about that. Are you ready to get um, um, to include some Russian uh, painters, maybe Black Square, or maybe this is not enough because our country was closed country? And, um, and uh, I know that in the Tate Modern uh, had um, a big Malevich exhibition and it uh, was uh, um, widely visited, uh, uh, record-breaking visits, so maybe it also affected this, this situation. Well, first of all, very, very sincere apologies about <laughs> Malevich. I have to say that two things. My list was not of the ten greatest works of art uh, in the world but it was of, and it was a very subjective judgment, that it was of the 10 that were most recognizable across the world. So, of course, I started with the Mona Lisa, and I included, it's not there anymore, but I included the Monk, the Scream, and various others, which have a high recognizability. But things are constantly evolving, and I do think, that the black square is an image that even in the past 12 months has become 
even more current uh, in the public imagination. Uh, obviously, major exhibitions like the one in the Tate help. But yes, um, when I hope I issue a revised version of the book in, say, 10 years' time, I will, I will definitely include the uh, Malevich Black Square. Thank you, I can leave it there. <laughs> I did my work. <laughs> So uh, now I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask Philip. So all the questions from the audience are welcome. If you can raise your hands, please uh, um, uh, do so, so that we could see you. Good evening, my name is Natalia. Thank you very much for your book. I really enjoyed reading it. You uh, say that sometimes works get lost or uh, disappear, but then suddenly they reappear, some finds them. Has it ever happened to you? Could you tell us about the most impressive things? For example, when something was um, um, uh, what was lost and then uh, you found it. Well, yes, this is the most exciting thing that can happen um, in an, an, an art specialist's life is rediscoveries of paintings that maybe you knew existed, that you knew were incredibly important, but that you felt probably had been destroyed, lost forever, somewhere, tragically. And I think easily the most exciting thing that ever happened to me in this respect was when I was incredibly lucky and was very, pretty early on allowed to go into the basement of the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg and see the group of paintings that had been really lost since the Second World War. Uh, they were being held there and were revealed to the world uh, in the early 1990s. But the extraordinary thing was that uh, up till that point, no one knew what had happened to these paintings. And perhaps the greatest of them was this absolutely marvellous oil painting by Degas. Probably the best oil painting he ever painted. It's a view of the Place de la Concorde in Paris. It's 1875. It's an absolutely marvellous painting. I knew it from textbooks, from textbooks that I had seen at university, where it was illustrated and always described as destroyed in the Second World War. And yet, there I was, standing in the basement of the Hermitage Museum, and I had the picture in my hands. It was the most extraordinary, almost the most extraordinary experience of my life, a real resurrection. Good evening. At the beginning of um, your talk, you mentioned that you were going to, to tell us about the story uh, related to Tracy Emin, and we are so intrigued. Um, we are looking forward to hearing about it. Well, um, okay, Let, let's just go back to that, um, if I can. Can we go back to my, to my, to my, my presentation? Okay, so this is this rather splendid neon, work in neon by Tracy Emin. And um, it was a source of, well, great embarrassment to me one, on one occasion in Sotheby's because we had it for sale. Uh, it was in a sale of contemporary art that was on view in Sotheby's, London. And Unexpectedly, a rather grand visitor turned up to Sotheby's. It was a um, lady member of the British royal family. 
She came unexpectedly and she wanted to be shown round. She was quite elderly uh, and through some uh, extraordinary freak, I was the most senior person in Sotheby's that day, so I had to take her round. And I thought, what would an elderly lady of the British royal family um, like to see? And I thought, yes, a good English portrait of the 18th century. I will take her up to see that. But stupidly, I took her just past a corner of the contemporary sale where this big pink thing was just visible. And she said, oh, what is that big pink thing? She said to me. And I said, your Royal Highness, you do not want to look at that. Um, come and see the portrait by Gainsborough. It's really interesting. And she said, no, no, I'm very, very interested to see that pink thing. What does it say? I haven't got my spectacles. And so I had to say, well, your Royal Highness, I'm afraid it says, kiss me, kiss me, cover my body in love. And she looked at me in a very old-fashioned way. And she said, very erotic. <laughs> so I always think of that member of the British Royal Family whenever I see a Tracy M. Good evening, my name's Olga. Uh, I, it was very interesting to hear to your lecture, but uh, I st it's still not clear who, sh uh, who identifies uh, um, uh, the prize. Uh, how do you identify the prize for each uh, uh, work? We had this film, One Plus One, uh, there, uh, and it says, um, it tells us a story about this rich man who had some nurse uh, and a servant, so he splashed some something and uh, he said oh great work uh, so they sold it for very uh, big amount of money so who are those people that affect the price of the painting and the starting uh, price of the lot how do you identify the starting price of the lot well of course um what one takes into consideration, apart from all the factors that I've been through up here, um, which of course don't necessarily apply with a work of contemporary art, where the terms of reference are a bit different. Uh, once the first thing one looks for uh, in establishing a price, a starting price, an estimate, is previous prices for that artist. So one tries to make comparisons with um, similar works that have been sold by that artist previously. But of course, every work of art is unique. And, uh, uh, and some just have no precedent. Um, so yes, it is possible that something by someone um, previously unknown uh, could come up and could uh, make a lot of money because someone even is trying to rig the market. But in practice, this can never be sustained. It's, it's, it's not something that um, the market will tolerate. I mean, there has to be precedent, there has to be uh, evidence that serious people are actually buying the artist over time. Otherwise, the price will just fall away. But I do think that um, you know, it's a good question, because particularly with contemporary art, with no real uh, precedent, no uh, points of comparison to go back to, that um, it is it is difficult to um, to estimate what's going to happen. But I would add one thing: uh, people often say about auction houses that they, uh, in some ways, make the market for certainly sometimes for new contemporary painters 
I would dispute that. I think what the auction houses are incredibly good at is reflecting a trend that is already there. But I've never yet come across a case of Sullivan's or Chris's actually starting something. Actually, it's, it's got to start elsewhere. And then Sullivan's and Christie's become reflectors and maybe even increases. But they don't start things artistically. Thank you very much for your talk. I absolutely enjoyed it. I would like to ask you three questions, if it's possible. First of all, at the start of your talk, you said that contemporary art is keying these days. And I would like to ask you what you think, um, what are the criteria for the contemporary art to sell? Do you think we still look at the same things that come here as well? Um, composition, uh, color, or size, or maybe there's a bunch of different things that we need to consider if, we, if we're talking about the art that sells really well. This is my first question. Shall I answer that first? Yes, please. <laughs> um, well, I think that it's clear that there is that, that contemporary art uh, pushes new boundaries and often this is actually a challenge to the market to come up with ways of quantifying and qualifying uh, the new art. But uh, it's interesting, for instance, you would have thought initially that conceptual art uh, would have been something almost impossible to sell on the market. But actually, it works perfectly well. I mean, if, you are, um, if you're selling the, 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 the pile of sweets by, um, whatever it's called, Garcia Torres, um, then it doesn't have to be the original pile of sweets that you are selling in the auction. It is the piece of paper, which is the certificate of authenticity, that gives the idea to whoever owns that piece of paper. So you are actually selling. It is, it is, it's like a sort of copyright. It's an, it is an ownership of an idea that is being bought and sold. So yes, a, you have to have an enormous new flexibility. And it's not just confined, obviously, to things like composition and color anymore. It's, it, it, it's expanded into you know, the exciting but difficult to define realm of ideas. And um, so it would, be, it would be difficult for me to have give this same talk just confining it to very cutting edge contemporary art. You're right. What's the next one? Um. I wonder what would be your advice for the younger generation of artists? What would you like to advise them um, if they uh, would like to be successful, if they would like to sell well? Um, how could they promote and market their work? Well, the interesting thing is that the way that young emerging artists succeed has not really changed, even though the nature of the art they produce has changed, has not really changed since John Orwell started marketing the Impressionists. I mean, he was, as I say, the first dealer to take on difficult contemporary art and really try to explain it and then market it and finally sell it successfully to the public. So I'm afraid there is not really um, a lot of choice open even to young artists now. It's incredibly important to get taken up by a good dealer, a dealer who's in sympathy with the way you make art and a dealer who you feel a sympathy for too. It's not dissimilar to the challenges that a writer faces, which I know a little bit about, having written a number of novels, that the huge first step you have to take is 
to write a novel that will attract not the publisher first, but the literary agent. You have to get an agent, otherwise you won't ever get, even get to the publisher. So there are a, a, a series of steps you have to take which are quite similar for young artists and for young writers. And the third one. Dear friends, thank you very much. I guess I have um, uh, to uh, just ask um, our last uh, question. So, Mikhail mentioned that you are a football fan. What's, uh, what's your favorite uh, football club? Well, my favorite football club, of course, is Chelsea. <laughs> But, I, but I'll just have, I just have one thing, one thing to add, that I was a Chelsea supporter 40 years before Mr. Abramovich bought Chelsea.